Well, good evening. What a joy and privilege it is to see you all once again. Praise the Lord for you. Um, what a mighty God we serve. I say it every time we come on, but I want you to know that he's a mighty God. He's an awesome God. He's an incredible God. There's no nobody like him. Nobody like him. Um, and we should not be afraid of anything because we, the God of the universe is our God. And uh, we give him praise, glory, and honor. God bless you, Miss Karen Ross. Good to see you. Good to see Mother Clara Lundy and uh, our, my good friend Gerald Smiley. Love you, man. I'm so proud of you as well. Family man doing your thing. Good to see you. Young man who played ball with my son in school. And uh, we just praise the Lord for you. So, the Patricia, I saw your post on six years of cancer free. To God be the glory for his goodness, grace, love, and mercy. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that we're not going to be afraid of anything. We're thankful that you are on your throne. Hallelujah. You reign mighty, supreme, and sovereign. You rule and you super rule in the midst of such uncertain times, such unrest. We shall not be afraid. We shall do as the word of the Lord says, cast our cares upon you because you care for us. God be with us, bless us, prosper our going in and our coming out. Let your word go forth in a mighty way and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Marvin Sapp, Bishop Marvin Sapp, reminds us in this song to not be afraid. Again, so good to see all of you and we praise the Lord for you. And uh, just excited. I, I really have, I really look forward uh, to, to our Wednesdays our Wednesday sessions, um, and so we praise the Lord for you, Sister Verdia, good to see you, and Brother Maurice Wright, and uh, my friend, God bless you, Kevin Pope, we thank God for you, um, and we praise the Lord for all of you, it's just good to be again in the land of the living, and to be healthy, people ask me how am I doing, I tell them I'm alive and healthy, I'm one step above excellent, you know, life is about attitude, and I choose to have a good attitude that my God is mighty, my God is a sovereign, he's supreme, he's incredible, and he is in control of all things, and, and all is well. Could be so much worse, and could be so much better, but it certainly could be worse, and so all is well. I'm here reporting victory over sin, shame, and I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm enjoying my trip. So I'm gonna get into the word of the Lord with you all. We've got an exciting word for you tonight so stick with me stick with us if you have a question you can type it in there and i'll try to see if i can glance over it periodically and see if i can catch any questions and this is a time where you know you have to be sure of your faith if you have been following me on wednesdays and sundays you know that i am god has me back to the basics of christianity really challenging our faith challenging do we really know jesus are we really significantly and seriously serving him on Sundays I'm teaching on the subject what Christianity is all about the last several weeks I've been teaching on holiness a proven foundation for a promising future uh, it is a foundation that is proven and I would like to suggest to you that as it relates to the holiness that we need not just for the future but the future is right now and the future is upon us even now and so we praise the Lord for that and I also want to let you know, I don't know what your testimony is. Mine is I have already voted, submitted my ballot, sealed it, signed it, and uh, hoping and praying that my candidates uh, win. And this is a very critical election, as has not been overstated. And so if you have not, please, please vote. And don't wait until the last day. We got, I think, three weeks left. But don't wait until the last day. I wouldn't even wait till the day of voting. I would get that absentee ballot and sign it and fill it out and sign it and send it in and 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 just just you know get that done because it's so so very very important a lot of important initiatives on the 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 ballot for Washington state and so I hope that you read through everything and make a very um conscious and very intelligent decision on what you would like to see happen in 
our world and in our country and in our, our region here. So praise the Lord. So don't forget, if you've not registered, please register to vote. I also want to give you quickly some information. I want to praise the Lord. You know, we're celebrating 30, <clears throat> excuse me, 33 years of ministry. And uh, this Friday, for the first time in 33 years, we're having a virtual anniversary. And so instead of us coming to, coming together, you know how we do, and you all are always so kind and cordial and beautiful and on, honorable to my wife and I as we just come, and you all are just nice enough to say congratulations, Bishop, on another year of ministry. And then this time it is 33 years. Uh, don't forget, it's actually this Friday, uh, um, uh, October 23rd at 7 p.m. And so if you just... Mark your calendar this Friday, October 23rd, 7 p.m. We will be having our virtual um, anniversary. And then it will be this Sunday. We'll have our regular service at 10 a.m. I'll be sharing in the word of the Lord. And then at 3 p.m., we'll be having a very special service with Bishop Louis Felton out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as our guest preacher. And he's an incredible and phenomenal articulator of the gospel. You don't want to miss that. You will be profoundly blessed if you'll tune in. So get the word out this Friday, 7 o'clock. This Sunday, we'll have our 10 a.m. service, and then we will have our 3 p.m., 3 o'clock afternoon service. Y'all ain't having anywhere to go, nothing to do, so you can. we should get bigger numbers than we've ever had. Spread the word, everybody, that this Sunday, this Friday at 7, and then this Sunday, our regular 10 a.m. service. God bless you, Sister Patricia, Missionary Patricia. We praise the Lord for you. And then don't forget um, that this Sunday at, at 3 p.m., you can watch it at on the Mount Calvary Facebook Live. You can also watch it. If you go to our website, you can watch it on YouTube. It'll be a YouTube Live. So you have either the Mount Calvary Facebook or YouTube. That's all, all three services that I mentioned. Or you can go to my Facebook page and receive it as well. And so I hope to see you all there. I'm excited about it. I really pray. You could really encourage your, your pastor and bishop. It's been a long six months. It really has been tedious, and it has been just full of ebbs and flows. And you could really bless me by tuning in and encouraging your family members. We could break some record and have literally thousands of people tuning in. That would be so awesome. Just tell all of your family, just come on. Friday, not much to do. It's going to be a very short service. You know, we're virtual, so we're not having these long services. So it's going to really bless you. It will certainly bless me to see that you are a part of it. That would really encourage me, and I could certainly use that right about now. So quickly, let's move into the word of the Lord. God bless you real good. I hope all is well. I've been praying for you. I hope you've been praying for me, and I hope that you have been praying as we are living in the most unprecedented time that I have ever known, uh, certainly in my lifetime. And if you study history, this how many, I can't see you, but wave your hand if you are ready for 2020 to, to leave, to go. Hasta luego, sayonara, aloha, uh, bon voyage, aha, <laughs> everything. Go 2020. We have had enough. Uh, you know, the proverbial saying, if anything can go wrong, it will. Well, we, we, we've experienced that this year, and they're still wrestling with and grappling to come up with a virus for this, for this lethal pandemic that we are encountering. And so please, let's just stay prayerful, saints, and be careful. Stay, stay diligent. Brother Wells, good to see you, man. And let's um, continue to trust the Lord. So I've been talking. Stay with me, please. Let's try and make this exciting. Again, and listen to me good. Sometimes I wonder, God, am I getting through with these simple things, because I'm not, I'm a preacher by nature. That's what God has called me and anointed me to do. <clears throat> I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, teacher. And I think my greatest gift is the ability to preach the word of the Lord, but I'm not here these weeks, these months to prove my preaching prowess. I'm here to challenge us, um, to challenge us. Good to see you too, Brother Wells. I'm, and you're gonna take me to lunch one of these days before Jesus comes back. I'm here to challenge us with right living. Folks, hear me, saints. It's amazing that I have to feel like I have to urgently plead with saints. And the problem is, unfortunately, and hopefully you're not a part of this group, but so many Christians today are not 
are not reading the Bible with any type of regularity at all. <clears throat> so it makes, um, Brother Sean, good to see you, man. Love you and your wife. Can't wait to get together with you. I know you're in the Seattle area and we're looking forward to great, great fellowship. Um, but so many people are not reading the Bible with any regularity. Uh, thanks. I can't emphasize enough how dangerous that is. And I've been talking about if you're really washed in the blood of Christ, if the blood of, if Jesus is really saved, God has really saved you through the blood of Jesus and the nature of God is in you, innate within that notion is a desire to know his word. And what makes my job so difficult, what makes Christianity under, anity under such fire, under such, such, challenge and such warfare now is that many, many Christians are not reading the Bible. You're not getting the word in your spirit. How can you, how can you not study this and behave like it? You cannot. And so we, we do things, we acquiesce to things, we, 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 we accept things that God has already called sin. Somebody was telling me that someone uh, told them that Jesus sinned. And I said, well, did you ask them the, the obvious questions show you in scripture where that's true? So because if you don't if you don't embrace scripture, then we have nothing to talk about. And if you do embrace scripture and embrace it properly, not this crazy out there in, in left field theology that a very minute amount of people uh, are trying to espouse, there's no way you can say that Jesus in the scripture is full of. Um, the Bible says he knew no sin, had no guile in his mouth. So you can say he's sin all you want to. I believe the scriptures and the scriptures say that he did not sin. He walked this earth as a human being, but walked free from sin. And there's not a book, it's not a verse in here that even insinuates that Jesus sinned. And so that's some false teaching and it's mixing up. It's got a lot of people screwed up. I mean, what is the relevance in even saying that, you know, how, why is that relevant? I don't even know why, um, but he, thank God Jesus did not sin. He chose not to. And, the whole, and the Peter tells us we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was tempted like we are, but without sin, yet he did not sin. So you can say Jesus sinned all you want to. If you can prove it to me in the scriptures, then I'll receive it. If you prove it any other way, I reject it because I, I walk by the scriptures. All right, this is this is my, this is what I follow, not not some philosophy, not not some time that we're living in, not some ideology or not some grandiose thought or teaching. I live by scripture and as Deacon Hayden said, scripture only. So don't ever listen to anybody who tell you Jesus sin. You pray for that person because that's bad theology. Amen. Um, that's bad theology. And uh, God bless you, Brother Bowman. We praise God for you. Uh, the theology is that Jesus, if he did sin, he couldn't have taken away our sins. And because it had to be a spotless lamb. If you study scripture from Genesis to Revelations, you know, the scripture and what they teach in, in, in seminary is that scripture interprets scripture. And the best interpretation of scripture is scripture itself. So if you take one scripture and try to come up with a doctor and you can't do that, you have to take all 66 books and what it all has to say about a specific subject matter. And then you come up with your understanding. And when you do that, you come up with a clear understanding that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation teaches very clearly that Jesus did not sin. So there's a lot of strange and false teaching uh, coming out now. You know, the Catholic Church is teaching things that for centuries it had not taught. Um, the Pope is really changing the theology of the Catholic Church. But those things shouldn't move you, saints. You know, um, America is changing the theology of the of, of, of the Christian church. Those things shouldn't move. So here's the thing that's important. What the Pope says is not the authority. What America says is not the authority. What the Bible says is the authority. All right. And um, when you when you when you don't study this book regularly, ah, the Bible says, Thy word have I hidden in my, my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you don't study this regularly, you're going to be you're going to you're going to be hoodwinked and acquiesced to uh, a teaching a philosophy uh, that that is totally anti-Bible, anti-God, anti-Christian. That's why I'm teaching right now what Christianity is all about. There's a lot of people walking around saying I'm Christian, who I believe, 
And I'm not the judge here, but I'm telling you, you know, a tree by the fruit of bear have not been washed in the blood of Jesus, according to scripture, because it changes and transforms your life. It's like some people say they're called to ministry, called to preach, called to ministry, and I never see you do ministry. I think you may have called yourself. Uh, but if God called you to something, there should always be a fruit, a manifestation of the call. And so I, I implore you, I implore you to read the scriptures and don't accept this crazy doctrine that's going around. I don't care who's teaching it. You better know the word for yourself. To that end, we've been talking about holiness, and we said that it's a proven foundation for a promising future, and I want you to know it stands the test of time, uh, both uh, present, past, present, and future, and we need to know that this foundation has to hold us up in the future because we need to teach this this theology. We need to teach this holiness to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and beyond. We have got to leave a legacy of the Word of God with our grandkids and great-grandkids, etc., etc. We must do this. That's why Mount Calvary is making a very concerted effort to really make sure that we have a children and youth and young adult ministry second to none. We must reach that demographic with the truth of God's word. Amen, somebody. And so we've been talking about holiness and, um, and you know, and, and what we know is I, I just a real quick recapitulation. We talked, we mentioned that holiness has stood the test of time. If you were not with us, some of these scriptures I'll read, but some of these I won't. We already did. We read scriptures like Levit Leviticus 11.44. I'm going to read that in a few moments. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read that in a few moments. We've read 2 Thessalonians 2.13, um, 1 Timothy 2.15, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 15 and verse 16. I just wanted you to you read these things for Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men, holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. So what becomes important if you just follow me just you know, minutely is we must ascertain what holiness is all about. Holiness without which the Bible says no one shall see the Lord. And so we begin talking about holiness and, and, be, and in the process of doing that, we talked about what a saint is. Because um, the Bible uses sanctified, saint, and holy. Those terms are kind of interchangeable. We talked about a saint is one that's set apart to be used by God for his divine purposes. And we, we mentioned that the Bible teaches that we should come out from the world and be separated, said the Lord. And we talked about the world is not the physical cosmos. Um, it's not the physical world, you know, how can you come out from it? We're, we're in the world, but not of the world. So it's not talking about physical creation, but the spirit of evil that is operated in our world and that de the devil has dominion over the Bible says come out from that. And it seems that the church is deciding that it doesn't need to come out from the world. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, lots of some things I don't sweat a whole lot. Uh, you know, I mean, but, you know, and, and some things we don't want to make a real huge, big, big deal of. But some things I wonder, you know, again, come out from the world to be separated. Some of you all know, um, well, I'll leave it alone because, you know, I mean, some of the things that we find ourselves doing and collaborating with people who have no inkling of who God is and but they want to talk about God, want you to join them in that process and then once they're through with you, they're cursing and getting high and doing everything they want to do. Uh, there has to be a difference. Come out from the world. The Bible teaches that. The world is that system of unsaved, uh, that unsaved society, that system that is established by Satan for Satan. Come out from that system that Satan controls now that you are saved and be separate. Be sanctified. Sanctification is a process that we're continually doing. The Church of God in Christ was established on the doctrine of sanctification by Bishop Mason, um, being set apart, sanctification. The Bible says, sanctify yourself, and the very God of peace will sanctify you wholly. Sanctification is a continuum. We talked about that, and we talked about um, the sanctification is a number of things. We asked uh, all believers, we mentioned that all believers, according to Romans 1 and 7, are called to be saints, and that means uh, about five things. Uh, it means, number one, that you're called to be separate to God. We talked about that, but number two, it, call, it means you're called to be dedicated. You're not a saint if you're not dedicated to the things of God. Number three, you're called to be purified from moral evil. And it, it suggests to me that we can be moral people if we are saints and truly holy. Number four, we're called to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And we talked about an image is a very close semblance of a thing. 
It is not the thing, but it looks so close to it. If you've ever stood outside on a sunny day and you'll see your shadow, we call it, your image, it is not you, but it looks precisely like you. And so when, G, when people look at you, uh, they ought to be able to see the image of Christ. That means we ought to behave like Jesus. We ought to be doing what Jesus did. Amen, somebody. And then number five, we said it's commitment to serve. So that's what a saint is. That's what a saint does. It separates, he or she separates himself. You're dedicated. You're, um, you're, you're, you're separated from purification, from the purification of moral evil. Um, you conform to the image of Jesus Christ and you commit to serve God. You can't, how can you be a real believer, a real saint, and you don't serve? Jesus said, even the son of man did not come, Mark 10, 45, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, that's amazing to me because Jesus served, but some of us feel like we don't need to serve in the kingdom. We join churches or we serve if it's convenient. If Jesus had just served us when it was convenient, I mean, they talked about him. They ostracized him. They called him a wine bibber. In other words, they're saying he's a wino. They called him a friend of publicans and sinners. They said he hung out with prostitutes. They called him a Beelzebub, a demon. And ultimately, they crucified him because they said he's, he's a heretic. All of these things, it was not convenient. Ministry is not convenient. Some of you all back out of ministry. You bail out because uh, you got into it with somebody or you don't like someone's leadership or, or leadership style or you don't, whatever. They, that, that, that's not what ministry is about. God didn't say it would be easy. We've got to work with all kinds of people if we're going to work in the kingdom. We're all different. None of us are perfect. Yeah, I don't like everything about me. So why, why can I spend my time condemning uh, the things I don't like about you and the things about me I'm working on? I don't, I'm not the perfect leader. You know, you, if you work with me, you, you're not going to get perfection. You're not going to agree with everything. But do you stop working with me because you don't agree? No, if you're called to service, it's not about who, who's leading the thing. It's about me serving in the capacity God called me in. And it won't be convenient. Sometimes I have to serve with people. I don't agree with as long as you're not compromising my faith, then, you know, give people an opportunity to be who they are. So many times we expect people to be a certain way. I used to be like this in ministry. I, when people come in my office, I mentioned this to you some time ago, you know, I would have these expectations of them and then I would get irritated when they came in and they weren't what I expected. And the Lord showed me, you've got to stop meeting people where you want them to be and begin to meet them where they are. So stop expecting them to be whatever it is you think they should be. That's why you're the pastor. That's why you're the shepherd. Your job is to meet them where they are and bring them to where they need to be. And so all of us need to give people, everybody shout grace, grace. Everybody needs to give grace out. Grace is giving people what they don't deserve, what you don't think they should get. Grace. We are here by grace. Come on, Sister Rose Croon. We're here by grace. When If it weren't for the grace of God, none of us would be here. God gave you what you did not deserve. You need to give somebody some grace. You need to give people grace. Stop being hard on people. You, you're not perfect. Stop expecting perfection from people. You know, stop having issues with people. Let's get beyond that. That's how the enemy keeps us divided and keeps us from really thriving and being what we're supposed to be in God because I don't like that leader, so I'm not going to work. If God called you over there, you better work even. I bet you Jesus didn't like being spit on, but he, he did it anyway. He kept serving. I bet you he didn't like it when they said that he's a that he's a liar, he's a wine bibber, and he he's a to be a friend of publicans and sinners was a terrible thing. I bet you when they talked about him for laying hands on the lepers, he didn't like all the negative talk. He didn't like when they spit in his face and and when they marched him up Golgotha's hill to crucify him. He didn't like any of that, but he gave people grace. What did he say, Father? When he's on the cross, you know what, Lord? I don't like these people, these Roman soldiers. And you know what, God? I'm gonna come off the cross. I don't like the way they're handling this. I'm I'm just not gonna die because I don't like the way my disciples abandoned me. No, come on, saying he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You need to give people grace. Stop expecting perfection from your pastor or 
anybody in the kingdom of God and give people grace. Give your pastor grace. I'm he, your pastor is one individual. Stop. You know, I've I've learned over 33 years of ministry. Everybody expects me to be the way they want me to be. How could I do that? If I do that, I I, I stop being myself. But let people be who they are. Some of you will get in, involved in ministry because, but you're so busy fixated on the person as opposed to the mission and the process and the promise and the purpose. It is to serve the kingdom of God. Am I talking to anybody? Uh, we need we need grace. Come on, shout, somebody shout grace. And so we've got to give grace out. And that holiness gives you the ability to give out grace. We talked about sanctification is instantaneous and it's positional and instantaneous. It's positional because we're in Christ. It's instantaneous that the moment you believe you you have it, but it's practical and progressive because you have to continue sanctifying yourself. And uh, we, we we talked about that, and when, then we last week we talked we we started talking about the importance of a foundation. Nothing can be established without a foundation. And we asked the question, what is holiness? And we read a few scriptures, and but we we talked about what holiness is not. We said it's not legalism. It's not a set of do's and don'ts. Legalism says. Holiness is identified by a certain standard or set of rules. No, that's not holiness. That's that's denominationalism. That's traditionalism. And I, two Sundays ago, I made clear to you all that uh, you can have your religion give me Jesus. Your Jesus versus religion. Jesus versus denomination. I mean, not denomination, but tradition. Because there's nothing inherently wrong with denominations. Uh, and there are some traditions that are very powerful and very good, but man-made tradition are not things that we should place a lot of stock in. Uh, and then we said that holiness is not denominationalism and it's not emotionalism. So what is holiness? Let's pick it up right there as we conclude for this evening in a few little bit. Turn over to a scripture I've read before. I want to read it again. What is holiness? We find the notion, first of all, we're introduced to it. Um, in the, in the book in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, chapter eleven, where you know they're being given all these instructions. You know, uh, they've exited out of out of out of Egypt, and they're given all these instructions. And, and you know, and then in, in the eleventh chapter, you know, they've been talk about foods that they've been instructed on foods to eat and foods to not eat, and those kind of things. And then he he gives these instructions, in chapter verse forty four. It says, "For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate." The word consecrate means to set apart. It means to, it, it means to be to be separate, to be set apart. Consecrate means to be holy. In other, you shall make yourself holy. He said, consecrate yourself, and you shall be holy, set apart. Consecration is 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 an act of devotion. It's an act of service to God. Set yourself in a position of service to God and be holy, for I am holy. And neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, what that could mean in the New Testament is don't defile yourself with any philosophy and teaching that's going on in the New Test in the 21st century that doesn't align with Scripture. Then he's saying, don't align with it. You've got to get this in your spirit. The Bible didn't change for the 21st century. Verse 45 says, For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. So holiness is what God is. Holiness is what God called us to. Holiness is God being set apart. Holiness means that God is pure. It means that God is unspotted. It means that God is different. That's what it means in its purest sense. God is different. And he's saying, you be different. You, If you're, if you're a believer, you have have to be different. And you know, you know, it, it seems kind of strange to me. The reason I came out from the world, I was tired of being in the world. Yes. And so if I was tired of the world, why would I go back to being like the very thing I came out of? I got tired of the parties and the nightclubs and all that. So why go back to that? I got tired of, you know, all the things I did that you do when you're in sin. So why would I flirt with what it is Going back to some of it because society is making it seem like it's okay when God called me to be different. And again, this is not this is not antiquated teaching. And the old folk would say it's tight, but it's right. If you take it, you can make it. But remember, remember, God sacrificed the best He had for you, and Jesus sacrificed His life. God sacrificed Jesus, and Jesus He 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 He, he went through the whole process and died. 
if that's not a sacrifice, if that's not setting yourself and showing yourself to be different, I don't know what is. And so you've got to get it, saying that Jesus had to go on a cross. I mentioned Sunday, we all have a cross to bear. Yes, we all have a cross that we have to bear. Would you look at Romans chapter 6? Holiness is what God is. Verse 19 through 22, Romans chapter 6. And uh, let us read again verse 19 through verse 22. I speak in human terms, Paul says, because of the weakness of your flesh. <clears throat> For just as you <clears throat> presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, you remember we did that when we were not saved, and of lewdness leading to more lewdness, so now present your members, your members, you know, because we do everything, you know, we, uh, excuse me, we sin and do it, whatever happens, we do it with our members, we do it with, you know, she said, present your members, present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So, again, I think where some people get it is you think that holiness, now that we got saved and all that, that it's an automatic thing. But holiness is a practiced thing. It is what you must practice. And you notice all the scriptures I've been reading, it, the instruction is what we have to do. It didn't say God's going God's gonna to present your members holy to him. You have to do it. And I think we're not doing a good job of the sanctification process of doing the work of being holy. We just think it's automatic or we go to church or whatever. No, he said you got to do it. In verse number 20 says, for when you were slaves of sin, and that's what you were, and you know, when you were in sin, watch this, nobody had to tell you to sin. Hey, man, you need to sin. You know you're a sinner. <laughs> we, we all sinned because we were sinners. We did what sinners do. It was automatic. Now, and then now if you're a slave to God, nobody should tell you, hey, man, you need to be holy. You need to be sanctified. You need to be separate. No, it's automatic. Come on, somebody. If, if nobody had to tell you to sin, nobody should have to tell you you need to be holy. It should be innate within you if you really, really got it. Again, we were slaves of sin. You were free in regard to righteousness. But verse 21 says, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And that's exactly what sin leads to. But verse 22 says, but now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, don't miss that. You, you, you belong to God. You don't belong to yourself. Now, that word slave should not be taken in the, taken in the, in the context of, um, Bella, yeah, you, you need that Holy Ghost that, you <laughs> that you're talking about. I'm a, I'm a, I want you to raise your hands right now to get that Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. We love you. Um, but listen, let me, let me say that again. We're not talking about slavery as what we knew, you know, when our ancestors were came here uh, from Africa and were placed on the shores of of, um, of Virginia and, and all the. We don't not not no not hard task mastery, but uh, uh, you know this is voluntary slavery because God doesn't treat us wrong. He doesn't mistreat us, um, and uh, and but God treats us the right way. But He wants you to know you are a slave to God. Amen. Come on, somebody. Um, you, you, you're a slave to God. So a slave doesn't do what he or she wants to do. It does what he or she does what the master tells him or her to do. And he says, you having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit in holiness. So holiness, holiness, holiness. Everybody say holiness. And the end everlasting life. So you get you 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 live holy, but you get you get a prize for this. You get everlasting life. And by the way. You want to stay tuned. I may be starting it next week, if not the week after. Oh, my God. I'm going to do a thing on rewards in heaven. It's going to blow your mind. Some of you who sit around just doing nothing, I guarantee you, if you stay with this teaching, when you come, you're going to start getting engaged in the kingdom because we all will be judged um, and, and in light of what we do down here as we go to be judged in heaven. Uh, it's not going to be like you think just, you know, you know, it's not, it's, it's going to be, so I want you to be a part of that. It's going to be a little bit more complex than that. You need to do the work down here. James said, faith without works is dead. Amen, Bella, raise your hands and get the Holy Ghost. All right. The Holy Ghost does make the difference. Let me, let me have you uh, turn over to First Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. First uh, Peter 2 and 9. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. This is real, this is real. This is real Christianity, saying this is not 
I'm not here to sugarcoat it. I'm not here to try to see if I can get 10,000 followers by saying sensational stuff, you know, because usually the truth of God's word, if folk ain't living right, they don't want to hear it. I'm, I'm here. I'm, when I go to heaven, God's going to judge me, and he not, I don't want him to say, you you, you were afraid to preach the truth because you were afraid what people would think because uh, you wanted more followers or you were afraid that people would misunderstand you or not like you or not come to your church. No, no, no. What we need in today's science is convoluted and messed up as our world is. We definitely need the truth of who and what God is. Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. Are you there yet? But you are a chosen generation. God chose you. You are a royal priesthood. Now, you know royalty by looking at going going to London and you look at the royal family, you get a good glimpse of, of what royalty is. I mean, they are honored, they're adored, they're respected, they're revered, they're significant. Now, there's so many things, but he calls us a royal priesthood. We're priests. We're priests before the Lord. A holy, there is a holy nation, a holy nation. Come on, somebody, a holy nation. Now, if you're holy, you can't be dabbling in things that are not holy. I'm going to say that again. If you're holy, you can't be dabbling in things that are not holy. Listen, you don't need to be a preacher, a pastor, a bishop, an ordained person to, to be able to lay hands on people and they get healed and get delivered. The problem is see, holiness is not just for vocational ministry. Holiness is for every believer. You ought to be laying hands on your children and your grandchildren and identifying spirits that are trying to attach to them. And you ought to be saying, in the name of Jesus, I call that spirit by its name. And I declare that you will not have my son, my daughter, my child, my grandchild. But you can't do that if you're mixing up your alleged holiness with the things of the world. You act like the world. You do what the world does. You talk like the world. Any and everything comes out of your mouth. Get, no, come on, man. That's what the enemy wants you to do because he knows you have no power. The proof is in the pudding. Those people who act like the world, go places the world goes, say things the world says, you know, allow whatever they want to say to come out of their mouth, behave any kind of way. When's the last time you prayed and somebody got healed or you prayed and somebody got delivered? When's the last time you prayed and you shook the devil's kingdom? When? When? I want to know because the devil's like, if I can keep you like that, I know you'll never get the power to be this holy person that bishop is talking about he says we're a holy nation his own special people wow his own special people we belong to god come on somebody that you may proclaim the praises that's why i tell you if you really want to get god's attention praise him man praise him uh tonight you ought to praise him in the morning you ought to praise him that's one of my regular things i am a praiser i lift up the name of the lord he said that you show for the praise of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. In sin, you were in darkness. In Christianity, in Jesus Christ, you're in the marvelous light. And so you've got to know holiness is what God is. It's what, he, it's what he calls us to. It means that he's pure. It means that we're called to be pure. Uh, amen, somebody. It, and this is what God called us to. Uh, it, 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 let, me, let, me, let me give it an even further meaning. Its primary meaning when you talk about what holiness is, is that, watch me, stay with me. Get these, get these, these words, these terms, these adjectives. It's, it's separation and consecration and devotion to service. You, holy people serve to service of God. So it's separation. Listen, now let's be honest, folks. I don't think, honestly, you know, if I'm going to preach with power and preach the kind of gospel that people will come crying, what must I do to be saved? If I'm going to pray for people and believe for their healing and even pray for my own body and believe for healing, if I'm going to preach, if I'm going to re represent Jesus Christ um, and, and really live this, you don't need to see your pastor and your bishop at a nightclub, come on, um, you know, drip, drinking on Cavassier, <laughs> come on, somebody help me right now, or, 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 or Cisco or whatever, it is. You, that, come on now, now if I do it, you're going to say, what is Bishop Witherspoon doing at that club? What is he doing with that drink in his hand? Um, and so, but, if, but if some of you do it, it, it how, how is it okay? We're, we're all called to be holy. See, I won't have the anointing. The anointing is the supernatural power of God upon you, enabling you to do what you could never do yourself. 
Um, it's the supernatural power of God upon you, enabling you to do what you could never do yourself. The anointing is that which calls me to preach, and somebody says, I want to get saved. I don't have the power to do that. The anointing is when I've been able to bless and lay hands on people, and I've seen demons literally come out. You can't be anointed like that, intertwining with the world and thinking I can do anything and behave. And does that make any sense, folks? This is not do's and don'ts. This is real Christianity. Um, and, and this is what God is calling us to. If I'm going to be anointed, if I'm going to move in power, I'm not going to be perfect. And I'm telling you that now. I'm not preaching perfection. I'm not teaching that we all sin and come short of the glory. We all make mistakes, but you shouldn't be a big ball of mistake. And you shouldn't be where if you told somebody I'm a Christian, they'd be like, what? Are you kidding me? I didn't know that. <laughs> come on. They ought to know that. Come on, somebody. Uh, I have... I've, I've, I've gone, I, this is the truth, and I, to God be the glory, I hope it means something. Uh, I've been in airports, and people have stopped me and said, uh, excuse me, are you are you a preacher? I'm like, yes, well, you look like a preacher. I don't know what that look me. I, I think that's a good thing. Or I've had people where I've gone places to speak, and they're like, uh, are you the preacher? You look like him. Or, or are you a Christian? You look like him. I mean, that, that's a, I, I would hope that something, remember, Christ in me, the hope of glory, Jesus Christ ought to be radiating in you so much so until somebody ought to look at you and say, there's something different about that person. But it cannot be so if you're behaving in every single way that the world is behaving. Amen? You know, um, uh, you, you know, if you, you, you call yourself, just think about it. You call yourself a believer and, and you know, you, you're teaching people about Jesus Christ and, and the ways of God and but then you, you, they see you doing things that, you know, because my point is, you, you know, sinners may not be saved, but they know when you do something that's not about salvation, they'll be quick to say, I thought you were a Christian. Who who wants to live where even sinners question our, our Christianity? huh? And But there's, again, I'm saying, so you won't think, well, well, that's just too strict. Listen, it was very strict for Jesus to go on that cross. It was not easy. I'm telling you, there is a sacrifice there's a commitment that goes with being Christian and being holy. So holiness, again, is about consecration and devotion to service for God. Uh, it, the idea is that it, you're, you are, you're to set yourself aside from the world. We talked about the world for God. Set yourself aside from the world for God. If you, So what am I telling you? Jesus is saying, if you accept me, there's a price you're going to have to pay. All right, I talked about it last week when we talked about discipleship on Sunday. If you're going to really be a Christian, there's something you must give up. If you've not given up anything, you're only a Christian with your words. You're, you're only a Christian with what you say, uh, but not in your life. Uh, so it, so it's, the idea is that of you set yourself aside uh, from the world for God, so thus you're separating yourself from the world's defilement, from the world's defilement, and you're sharing in God's purity. Let's be honest. If God is, you, you don't even have to ask, what things are pure about God? Let's do it like this. Some things you say, do, or go, you, do, you, do you think that's the purity of God? You answer that. Don't even, don't even fake me out right now. Come on. You know, is that the purity of God? If you know it is not, you should not be engaging in it. And this is not strict. I'm telling you, this is theology. This is gospel. This is the Bible. There is a price to be paid to be holy. So it means to be set aside from the ordinary purposes for the service of God. Holiness is, a, again, is a price to be paid. You're set apart from the ordinary purposes for the service of God. It's the process of standing in close relation to God and serving him acceptably. If you're not serving, you're not living a holy life. Holiness is about service. It's about setting yourself apart. I Again, I say, I don't want to be like the world. I don't want to be in the club. This is me. I don't want. I don't want. I don't want. I don't want to be drunk. I don't want the alcohol. This is me. I, I want to be different. I don't want to hit the blunt. This is me. I, I don't want to use. I don't want to curse you out. This is me. I, I want to be different. I, I take the challenge. I accept the challenge that living for God means I have to be different. I have to give up some things that I don't want to give up. There are times in my flesh when there are some words I could say to some people, and I would feel so much better. 
Oh, come on, somebody help me right now. But somebody just say, help him, Lord. But I don't say those words. I'm not going to curse anybody out, even if my flesh wants to. Watch this. I'm being honest right now. I'm being real. It sounds comical, but I'm being real. My flesh has wanted to punch people in the face. My flesh has wanted to curse people out. My flesh has wanted to talk about people and run their name down. But the spirit, man, remember we have those two natures. The nature of sin always wants to do what sin does. Those are the natures of sin, cursing somebody out and punching him in the face and all these things. But my spiritual nature says that's not the, that's not holiness. So I must always, and it's my choice, allow my spirit man to supersede and override my natural or my sinful man. Are you all with me here? There, there, there are those two natures, um, and 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 if we don't. If we don't understand that, you know, usually that sin nature will sneak on you and do some things that you never thought it would do. So, so there are things that I, I would love to do, but because I'm holy, I won't do them because that's the price. That has to be. I can't tell you off and you know you deserve it. Yeah, I mean, Lord, they deserve, they deserve that we, I give them every four letter word there is, but that's not holiness. That's not the anointing. That's not the will of God. You know, we used to have to say WWJD. What would Jesus do? You know, Jesus would never curse anybody out. But you know, some places you don't even have to ask yourself, would Jesus be there? You know, he wouldn't. You know, there are some teachings that Jesus wouldn't accept. You know, there are some philosophies that Jesus would not embrace. You know that there are some things about America and the 21st century that Jesus would frown upon. Don't act like you don't know it. If you're really going to be holy, you're going to have to pay a price. I know y'all didn't bargain for this when you tuned in, but I'm trying to get you to heaven. I'm trying to, I, and I want to get there and hear the words well done. So now as I, I move toward a conclusion here, that word holy in, in the noun form is hagiosmos. Hagiosmos, it's the, that's the Greek word in the noun form. And that Greek word means it denotes ethical purification. It includes the idea of separation. There it is again, hagiosmos. It, 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 it includes separation, namely the separation of your spirit, your spirit from everything that is impure and polluting. All right, set your spirit. You have to do this. God's not going to do it for you. And rejecting those sins, uh, which the desires of your flesh and your mind lead to. I just mentioned that earlier. So, so hagiosmos, the, the noun form of being holy, is separating your spirit from everything that is impure, your spirit. All right, and, and everything that is impure and polluting and rejecting those sins that desire, the desires of your flesh want to lead you to, you have to reject them. That's what true holiness is. Y'all are acting, thinking God's going to do things he's not going to do. You have to reject them. And if you're holy, you will reject them. Can somebody say amen to that? The problem is a whole lot of folk are not living holy. I mean, Christianity has been so watered down. It has been so taken out of context and it has been so weakened. And uh, until we, what I'm teaching now, to the, even some of you watching, maybe it doesn't even really make a lot of sense to you. It's like, man, I don't agree with all that. Well, I, I'm breaking it down to you in the scripture. So, so sanctification or holiness is the state predetermined by God for, for each of us as believers. He's predetermined into which, um, into, into which in grace he calls us. So, so in other words, he's saying, I'm giving you the grace to be holy. I'm giving you the grace to be sanctified. So he's saying what I'm teaching tonight, you can do because I'm giving you the grace to do it. The question is, do you want to do it? Do you want to be set apart? Do you want to be different? Do you want to be undefiled? Do you want to be pure? Do you want to be holy? Do you want to be sanctified? Do you want to be the thing that he, so he, it's the grace that he's called us to. And by which as Christians, it's a course that we must, must pursue. We have to pursue the remember first Timothy first Peter two nine you're a chosen generation, a royal priest of the holy nation, a special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. And so holiness is what you can do. It's a foundation that has been proven that throughout the, the annals of time. Now so here's what I want to say. Um, we got to see into the future, but I want to say that the future is here right now. The future is here right now. The church, what we have to do, and I'm going to be done in the next few fleeting moments, we've got to stop reacting and we've got to start anticipating. Think about that. And I think we rely so heavily upon upon the leaders in the church, you know, the, the bishop, the pastor, and 
apostle, evangelist, prophet, teacher, and you know those in vocational ministry, we all should, should start anticipating what is your next move, devil. I'm going to be there before you get there. Before you bring it out, we're going to know what you are about. But then also, we've got to know that a revolution is happening before our very eyes. The word revolution means radical and complete change. And that's why holiness, teaching what I'm teaching tonight, is so challenging because of we're in the midst of a revolution. And this revolution is very anti-Christian, very anti-Bible. You, my brothers and my sisters, have to make some very succinct and calculated decisions. And now is the time for you. I had to move that, my hand, because that reminds me of a certain president. So, I don't, <laughs> uh, so we, but we have to realize that, you know, um, we, there's so much that has changed in our land, in our world, and we have to be cognizant of it. And we have to say, Lord, you know what? Even though it's changed there, even though that's happened, I still have to be holy. And I understand that a revolution is taking place, but that doesn't make it right. That doesn't mean because everybody's saying it that I should embrace it. That's why the only thing I can say, as opposed to just saying amen to me or I disagree, read this for yourself. Is that fair enough? Read it for yourself. And if I got it wrong, then you come show me and I'll, and I'll, I'll apologize. Read it for yourself. But if you don't know this, you don't be condemning what I'm saying because I'm trying to help you. So, so we got to understand that we got to start anticipating, stop reacting. We've got to understand, secondly, that a revolution is taking place right now. And uh, I think the third thing that's important in this, in this time of holiness and as a proven foundation and embracing that the future is now is that we must have integrity. The church must have integrity. We've got to get our integrity back. We've got to get our respect back. People don't respect us. We've got to get it back. That's why all of you all need to get involved in ministry. We've got to be feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and sheltering the outdoors and showing grace and mercy and favor and loving on people. This is when true Christianity is going to get its luster back. But the church has to be sensitive to people's needs. Are you with me here? That's what I'm talking about. Sensitive to their need. Uh, homelessness is out of control in Seattle. Somehow all of the churches ought to get together and do something to get people off the street. Uh, we, we, we be sensitive to their needs. But as I said earlier on, uh, don't expect people to be how you think they are. Let them be themselves as you're sensitive to the need. Let people be who they are. Let them be who they are. You don't have a right to to want to tell them they ought to be a certain way. You, you you ought to do like the Williams brothers said, sweep around your own front door before you try to sweep around mine. And my, my pastor was an old country man from Homer, Louisiana. He was my uncle. I loved him dearly. Um, he said, uh, I got six months to mind my business and six months to leave yours alone. So, you know, there's some truth to that. I don't have time to scrutinize your life. I just don't. I don't have time. That makes me a hypocrite because I'm messed up myself. I'm trying to make it. Well, I'm gonna take forgive me. I'm not messed up, but I'm 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 a human trying to trying to make it in myself. I'm imperfect. I'll say that. And so, why am I scrutinizing your life now? So, um, the future is for prepared people, and the future is upon us right now. I want you to know that it's upon us right now, and and we've got to understand something that as a church. Um, we're going to have to know that we have the foundation of holiness and we've got to use it and live it out for the glory of God. People don't want to hear sermons. They want to see them. Let me say that again. People don't want to hear a sermon. They want to see a sermon. They don't want to hear it. They want to see it. They want to see it in you and see it in me. Um, so we've got to understand that the only hope left for the world is Jesus Christ. Would you agree to that? So saints, thank you for listening. And we, we've got work to do um, because nothing is established without a firm foundation. You don't build a house without a foundation. You don't build a tall building without a foundation. You don't build academics without a foundation. You don't build holiness without a foundation. It's sanctification. It's setting yourself apart to be used by God. There are some sidetracks and some obstacles to holiness. One is legalism. And that says holiness is identified by certain sets of standards or rules. That, that's an obstacle that we've got to reject. Uh, or two is, uh, and, and, and it, what it says is, you know, these set of rules and things like, you know, what you have on, what you what make, all stuff that, it, excuse me, not relevant to anything, um, places that are forbidden, some things that, now there's some places you shouldn't go, but some things are just, you know, just tradition. And we've got to be willing to, to know what the difference is. And we've got to always trust the Holy Spirit to do the convincing in our lives. Would you, would you would receive that? If you really have the Holy Spirit in you, 
<laughs> he will convict you more than I will. Say amen, Bella. He will convict you much more than I can. And that's why I, I'm glad I have the Holy Spirit because he tells me, look, that ain't, that's not right. You know, don't do this, don't do that. That's his job is to convict me, to convince me. Uh, he'll, he'll point out to us, and if we listen, we'll be better because of it, all right? So God bless you. Remember that holiness is, is not emotionalism. Now, when you get the Holy Spirit, you're going to feel some emotion, but it's not about emotionalism. It's about an experience. It's about a relationship with a holy God, and it's about doing things that you don't have the power to do yourself, but God will work them out through you. I hope and pray that these last few weeks, you have learned some things about holiness, that you understand that being a Christian is more than just waking up saying, God, thank you for waking me up this morning, and I'm going to go about my business. There's work to be done. When we come back together, 100% of the members of Mount Calvary ought to be engaged in ministry. 100% of the kingdom of God, uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, ought to be engaged in ministry, and you should be able to work with whomever. Even if you don't care about them in the natural, in the spirit, you got to move your natural out of the way, and you got to say, for the sake of the kingdom, I'll work with whomever, I'll get whatever, I'm going to stop looking at people, because if you look at yourself, you probably got enough to deal with on your own. So God bless you. I hope that you receive something from this, saints. Will you pray for me as I pray for you? Don't forget, this Friday, our anniversary starts at 7 p.m. this Friday. Tune in on either my Facebook Live, Mount Calvary Facebook Live, that's the, probably the best option, and also you can go to the Mount Calvary website, www mountcalvarycc.com and then you can go to live stream um, stream live and, and click YouTube and you can watch it on YouTube or again my page so whichever one and then Sunday got a powerful message waiting for you uh, what I'm looking forward to delivering to you on Sunday at 10 a.m. and then we'll take a break and come back at 3 and we've got a great great preacher out of Philadelphia who's going to bless us and you'll be able to go on those platforms and invite somebody to be a part of it. Amen. God bless you. I hope that you continue to have a great, great, great week. Uh, may the favor of God be upon you. May you walk in his victory, in his success, in his authority. May you be holy. May you be sanctified. May you be pure unto the Lord. Not perfect, but may you work on your salvation. Yes. May you be healed. May you walk in prosperity and favor. May your family be blessed. May you be protected from COVID-19 and from all sickness and disease. I rebuke cancer and heart disease and brain tumors and high blood pressure and diabetes and all of these diseases. I rebuke them off of the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you walk in the prosperity and the favor of God. May God overwhelm you with a sense of his presence and may he exceed your expectation. The Lord bless you real good. Saints of Almighty God, would you please be a blessing to the work of the Lord. God bless you, Brother Williams. God bless you. Um, Bertram, did I get that right, Williams? God bless you. And all of you for tuning in. Thank you. Maybe you should share this and maybe somebody could stand and see this and be blessed by it. I'd love for you to share. I want this to go all across the country because I believe this is the word of the Lord for today's times. Again, my job is not to be popular. My job is to preach the truth, teach the word of God. I kept the Bible with me at all times, and if you want to argue with the scriptures, so be it. But I encourage you to study this. The word of the Lord says, um, Tim is in the book of Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so may you do so. Please be a blessing to the work of the Lord. We really need your financial support. If I, I need your help. I, I really do. Even if you have friends, comrades, family members who are looking for a ministry or a nonprofit organization that they can invest in, please point them toward Mount Calvary. We're doing some wonderful things to advance the kingdom, and we've got many, many things that we still need to do. We've got to build a sanctuary for the Lord. We've got to do so many things. We've got to really invest deeper into our children, our young adults, and our teenagers, saints, and we need your financial support to do that. You can text your giving to 77 Mount Calvary Christian Center to 77977. Mount Calvary CC, or you can go on a website and give, or you can give through our phone app. Please don't wait until Sunday. Be a blessing to the work of the Lord. Let's pray as we prepare to leave. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for this election. Let's pray against all the racial unrest. Let's pray that revival would come to America, that revival would come to the world. Let's pray that God would forgive us of our sins, heal our land, 
and avert this COVID-19 virus. They say that it is that it is um, coming back with a vengeance, as it were, that it's on an uptick again. Let's pray that God, how many know the effectual and fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much? God hears the prayers of the saints. If you would, someone join them by the hand. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who is, was, and evermore will be, I want to thank you, dear God, for your goodness, your grace, your love, and mercy. Hallelujah. I want to thank you for ruling and super ruling in our universe. Lord, in the midst of so much craziness and unrest, we do realize that sin will do what sin does, but that nothing will happen without you allowing it to do so. And Father, we pray against this COVID-19 virus, Lord, and all the sickness and disease that tries to attach itself to the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ and to people of color and African-Americans. We pray against it, Lord. Let the people of the Lord be healthy. God, would you please forgive the church, forgive America, forgive this world of our sins. Would you please blot out our transgressions and would you heal our land? Would you take this virus and obliterate it, Lord? Have mercy on us, God. And would you please send revival in its place? Thank you, Lord. Set America and the world back on fire for you. Lord, may we vote in politicians who love you, who will serve you, who will do what is right. May you, we, we pray that salvation, Christianity, holiness would infest our political system. It needs it so bad. Infest our judicial system. Infest our educational system. And infest our financial system. And, and on and on and on. We pray, Father, now. Now for every person under the sound of my voice, I bless you. I declare the favor and the prosperity of God upon you. God will protect you and keep you. God will prosper all that you do as you submit to his will. And now, God, go with us and keep us. Watch over us, protect us, and keep us safe until we meet again on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And then back Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. We're going to tell people about it. And we're thankful that even now your word is going to go forth in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shout amen. Good to see my cousin Chris Hawkins. God bless you, man. The Lord bless all of you. I hope that you got something from the word tonight. Please, please keep praying for me. I covet your prayers. I shall look forward to seeing you Sunday morning. The, the word is going to bless you. And then Sunday afternoon, actually this Friday, don't forget, 7 o'clock is going to be a great time. Blessings on you.